Welcome. My name is Don Sari. I'm a professor of mathematics and of economics. I'm also a director of a research institute called the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences here at the University of California, Irvine. In mathematics, one of the areas that I've been interested in is the evolution of the universe. How does the universe evolve? How do the planets uh, move away from each other? How do the galaxies move away from each other? This was an issue that started 300 and oh, about 330 years ago by Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, the best he could do is with a two-body problem. Now the two-body problem would be like the sun and the earth, and the earth going around the sun, no moon, no other planets, no other stars. And so therefore the song Starry Starry Night would have no meaning. It would be just this two-body problem. And he solved that problem. Left the rest for the rest of us. And then, oh, about 90 years ago, a French mathematician, uh, Jean-Charles uh, uh, Chazy, what he did is he found how to find if you have three bodies and how would they separate from each other as time goes to infinity. And then starting with my PhD dissertation, Moving on, I started worrying about uh, what happens for any number of bodies. You know, billion bodies, or 10 billion, or a trillion bodies. Uh, uh, how do they separate from each other according to Newton's laws of gravity? And I, I, fortunately, I was able to discover how this happens, how galaxies form, how the galaxies separate from one another, how clusters of galaxies form, the configurations they have to shape, and and on and on. A lot of fun, very, very exciting. Uh, currently what I'm doing is, um, oh, you've heard of this thing called dark matter. Uh, a big, big mystery. Uh, what is dark matter? Uh, uh, we're spending billions trying to find what it is, but there's only two things. We don't know what it is or where it is. And uh, by use of mathematics, I'm trying to show, and I believe I have shown, that the reason we don't know where it is or what it is is because there isn't anywhere near as much as what they believed. Where does it come from? It comes from the idea, for, again, from Newton's laws. It comes from looking at how the stars uh, rotate around the center of a galaxy. And the stars are moving at such a speed that the belief is that we need much, much, much more mass in the center if we don't, the stars are going to blow off. They're going to, the whole galaxy is going to dissipate. And uh, some of my results are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a mathematical computation. This isn't an issue from astronomy or astrophysics. It's from mathematics. And so the question then is, did they make a math error? You know, just like on your test. You took a test of mathematics, I know how to do this problem. You got it back and you said, oops, screwed up. Didn't get the right answer. Same thing. Maybe the astronomers, uh, when they're computing how to compute the amount of mass, made a mistake. A math mistake. And that's what it appears to be. We, uh, and we're, in fact, uh, just before I came here, I was on the phone talking with some mathematicians from my previous university of Northwestern University, where indeed uh, we're trying to get better mass computations with the theory I developed. Now that's mathematics and astronomy. Let's move to mathematics and the social sciences. One of the issues that I have on the social sciences and uh, that, that I find fascinating is voting theory. Now, voting theory. What's there to do with voting? I mean, don't you just mark uh, your ballot and that's it? No. Voting theory is really the mathematics of trying to understand what voting method, what ways to tally a ballot will give you an outcome that most accurately reflects what the voters want. Can there be an error? Oh yes, there can be a lot of errors. And the outcome can be very sincerely, you can get an outcome that isn't uh, what you want. Let, let, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, I'll, I'll skip politics, I, I, because in politics I could go on and on and on. So let's just try something that uh, all of us know uh, comes award season. Let's take a look at the um, 
Oh yeah? Who, what movie gets the Academy Award? They have a voting system. And at the end of a lot of these Academy Awards, we say, how in the world did such and such a movie or such and such an actor or actress get that award? I mean, something went wrong. And well, you know what that something is? It's their voting system. It's the way in which they tally the ballots to try to find out what's going on. This is a very, very subtle problem. It's a problem that was recognized, oh, a couple of thousand years ago. And uh, the French mathematician uh, Jean-Charles de Borda and uh, Condorcet, both are French mathematicians, they are the ones who brought it in around 1770. They started worrying about uh, how you, everybody has exactly the same preferences. You tally the ballots one way, you get one answer. You tally the ballot another way, and you get a completely different answer. So what's the best method? And that's one of the issues we've been looking at. Let's go back to the movie. Remember the movie Cold Mountain? Ah, critically acclaimed, box office acclaimed, on and on. And because of the voting system, it did not get a nomination for Best Actor for the movie and a large number of other things. It was not the voters who were at fault. It was the voting system. Let's take a look at another place where the uh, voting systems play an important role and where you might say, how in the world did that song win? The Grammys. The Grammys have a voting system to try to first filter down uh, what songs are going to be put forth. Uh, and then they vote to see which songs are going to win the Grammy. This is a voting system, and I've been working with the Grammy award systems on how to change uh, their voting system so that it more accurately reflects what the voters actually want. So this gives you a flavor. So what we have is astronomy, we have voting systems, and this gives you a flavor of what goes on here at UCI, at University of California, Irvine, where at least in the part that I'm involved in, we're learning how to use mathematics to uh, address the uh, wonderful puzzles that are out there. Puzzles that come from political science, that come from astronomy, that come from the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences in terms of psychology, in terms of how people can understand uh, emotions, can understand faces, can understand color, and these all break down into fascinating, fascinating mathematical issues, uh, which uh, we find to be challenging. Voting systems, why in the world are they flawed? I mean, we've been using them for, for millennia. Uh, what we do is we, get, we learn this right from kindergarten. Uh, when we have a show of hands to try to find out what's the beverage uh, we're going to have, this Kool-Aid or that Kool-Aid. You know, a way to show what's wrong with the usual plurality voting system is to wonder what would happen if tomorrow in the local school system, if the superintendent of schools all of a sudden said, from now on, we're going to rank students strictly according to the number of A's they receive. Sounds fair. Sounds like we're getting a lot of excellence. But are we? That means the person that got A in gym and F in everything else is going to be ranked above the student who has all Bs. So when you talk about our plurality voting system, where we vote for one candidate, that's exactly like this school system where they're going to rank students according to the number of A's they have. To really truly rank the students, we have to know how a student does in all of the courses. I mean, the B scores have to play a role, the C's, etc. Uh, the French mathematician by the name of Jean Charles de Borda, which who I mentioned earlier, came forth with a system which is very much like our five point, four point grading system that we use for A gets four points, B three, two, one, zero. And uh, he put it forth for the Academy of Sciences, for the French Academy of Sciences in the 1770s. 
They found that the system that they were using earlier, the plurality vote, was giving them distorted outcomes. But when they used the board account, the outcomes they got were outcomes that they could agree with. And they continued to use this outcome until a new member of the French Academy of Sciences wanted to change the voting system to the old one because he could manipulate it a little bit. And the name of this uh, new member, Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, the issue has been around since 1770. We know that if we, uh, you know, that if, if we have to include more information about who a person has as their second rank candidate, their third rank candidate, their fourth rank candidate. And it's easy to come up with real world examples where the choice of weights makes a difference, a big difference, where you could have a uh, outcome which has Anne, Barb, and Connie with one method. Nobody changes their mind. No voter changes their mind. We just change how many points we're going to give to first place, second place, and third place. And the outcome now will be Connie, Barb, Anne, the exact reverse. So what we learn then from this procedure is a frightening fact that an election outcome need not reflect the views of the voters. It could more accurately reflect what voting system, what ways you're telling the ballots you're using. So the mathematical question then is, was to try to find what weights, what voting type procedure can you use so that the election outcomes will reflect what the voters want. And uh, that took me only a short time, 20 years. <laughs> but uh, I was able then to uh, crack that problem. And I was able then to show which voting systems more accurately reflect the views of the voters. Uh, voting system is now being used by various groups. Uh, uh, it's being used by the um, Dove uh, Music Award for country music. It's being used uh, in the first part uh, for the Grammy Awards and uh, on and on. In fact, the number of things go wrong is so bad that I like to joke, and remember this is a joke, I like to joke that before your next election, you can hire me for a price. I will come to your organization you tell me who you want to win. I will go through and talk to all of the people in your group. I'm an outgoing guy, so I'll talk to everyone. I will then construct a fair election procedure, and your candidate will win. It turns out it is not difficult to do this. The point is, not that you can cheat. The point is, is that if I can construct a voting system that you say sounds pretty good and I can choose the outcome in, a, in, in advance, it says that this is a serious, serious problem. The choice of a voting system matters. It matters a lot. And uh, that's exactly what we've been working on. Uh, we're now working with lawyers and people in the law, area of law, in terms of uh, uh, some of the questions that they're looking at and how they're related to the same issue. I mentioned that I was the director of the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences, and eh, what is that? What, what, what does mathematics do with the behavioral sciences, like psychology, and, and also some of the social sciences, like political science, etc.? Well, mathematics and voting, that, that's a natural connection. But let's take a look. For a couple of millennia, there has been this symbiotic relationship between the physical sciences and mathematics, where an advance in one area motivated what's going to be done in the other area. You know, we see this with geometry. We see this with a large amount of mathematics that we learn in high school, etc. It's where the motivation for the mathematics came from physical advances, and with the mathematical advances, now new physical advances were possible. 
The trouble with the social and behavioral sciences is that they're far more complicated than the physical sciences. The physical sciences have a limited number of variables. But just look at yourself when you're ordering a cup of coffee. Well, let's see, how do I feel? Uh, is this too hot now? Well, let's see, do I have time before class? You look at the number of variables and the number of issues that are involved, and it is very, very complicated. And so the issue is, how in the world can we create a symbiotic relationship between mathematics and the social and behavioral sciences? And that is precisely what's going on at the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences, where we're looking at the questions, questions that may come up in terms of how do social norms, how are they developed? Uh, example of a social norm, uh, not that long ago uh, when people were driving down the road and their cop, uh, pop was empty, they toss it out the window. Or they go to the grocery store and they pick up a bag, a plastic bag, rather than their own, etc. The social norms have changed. What is accepted have changed. Is there a way to understand how social norms come about? Well, this is where we're using mathematics to understand. This is just one of the many, many exciting things that are going on at the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences. Another area would be one of vision. We have sight goes inside here. How is it interpreted in our brain? And there's all kinds of mathematical mysteries which uh, uh, we're just beginning to discover why they come about and uh, how to start explaining them. So quite frankly, the, uh, uh, we expect that the work being done at, the, at our institute will uh, make a very big difference in putting forth uh, the new frontiers and new questions and new answers.